How many of you have read this book yet? Okay, no. good. <laughs> the American War. 20 pages. Okay. Yeah, 20 pages. Okay, that's a, that's a good number of pages to read. Um, that's fine. I only asked that to get a temperature about, you know, some people are really obsessed and want to get into all the characters and why did you have her make this move at this time. Um, so we know kind of who we're talking to. Um, and I'm sure by the end of the session you'll want to read it. Um, and he'll be signing it. So I was, um, let's just jump right in, Omar. Um, we'll, what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit and then we'll um, ask for different questions and comments and then we'll ref reflect on those and answer those and go in and out in conversation, right? Um, so relax, you know, get, get ready to chat with us. Um, I, was, I was asked to, to be in conversation with you and frankly when they sent me the, the book and the title, I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I mean, with everything going on, do they really want me to read this giant book about the next American Civil War? Um, and, uh, and, but I was, I was fascinated by it. And I was, I was truly, truly engrossed. And I'll just read the one, um, the one bit on page 10 that just sucked me in. Right? So I'm reading this book, and I'm like, who is this author <laughs> writing about this stuff that we have to deal with today? Um, and uh, he's, he's in the book is describing the main character and it goes her name was Sarah T. Chestnut but she called herself Surat. The latter was born of a misunderstanding at the schoolhouse earlier that year. The new kindergarten teacher accidentally read the girl's middle initial as the last letter of her first name, Surat. Mm -hmm. To the little girl's ears the new name had a bite to it. Sarah ended with an impotent exhale, a fading ah that disappeared into the air. Sarat snapped shut like a bear trap. Mm. And so when I read that, I was like, who is this woman? Uh, yeah, so tell us, Omar, who is this woman? Um, thank you very much for doing this, by the way. I appreciate it. And thank you all for coming out. Um, like most of my friends and family who haven't read this book, um, I'm glad you decided to come out here anyway, and I, I appreciate that. Um, so, for a long time, when I was writing this book, um, I had a thesis statement. Um, you know, I wanted to write about um, the universality of revenge. I wanted to write about this idea that, that people subjected to injustice um, become damaged the same way. They become broken the same way. They become vengeful the same way, regardless of where they exist in the world um, or what their background is. So I had this thesis statement, and I built a novel around it, um, or an idea for a novel around it, but I didn't have a central character. Um, and then uh, one day, Surat Chestnut came to me. Uh, she's the only part of this book that, that arrived fully formed. At the beginning of this book, you meet her. She's six years old. Um, she is sitting on the porch of her parents' home, which is a repurposed shipping container uh, in southernmost Louisiana uh, by, the, by the shore of the Mississippi Sea, which is what the Mississippi River has now become thanks to climate change and rising sea levels. Um, and that's the only image that showed up in my mind. And I, Once she showed up, I knew that the book was hers uh, more than, than anything else. Um, she, I'm not one of those writers who, who subscribes to the notion that the, the best characters uh, have all their traits taken from people you know in real life. Um, she doesn't have anything in common with me um, besides that sense of feeling somewhat unanchored. Because um, of, of not having a good answer to the question, where are you from? You know, I was born in one place, I grew up in another. I'm a citizen of a third country and now I live in a fourth. Um, and I feel unanchored much of the time. And so that's the only thing I have in common with her. Other than that, she's, she's much braver than me. She's much smarter. Um, and I don't, I don't think if we met in real life, she would like me. Um, which is an interesting thing when you have to live with a character for, for two years. Um, but it's, it's her story more than, more than anything else. And so how did you, so you said she, the book had this thesis, you had this idea, and then you didn't have a main character, and then she showed up. And so what was that process like after she showed up? How did you um, have her kind of take the, take the reins from you, or take the reins from this thesis that you had kind of um, built up? How did she drive the work? Well, so the, the book is largely the story of her, the entirety of her life. You know, we meet her from the time she's six, and we go to the end of her life. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, the, the, the book is a fictional account of a second American Civil War. It takes place a few decades from now. 
Um, and it takes place nominally over, over the issue of uh, fossil fuel prohibition that the federal government is trying to impose. A number of southern states decide that they would rather secede than go along with this. Uh, and that sparks a second civil war, um, the kinetic part of which is very, very short. The South loses the war almost immediately. Um, and what, for which is what would happen. Um, uh, what follows is a kind of years-long insurgency where the, where the sort of the diehards of the South uh, effectively act as, as terrorists um, or freedom fighters, depending on, on which side you're on. Um, and her life takes place in this context, in this sort of cold aftermath of, of a very hot Second Civil War. Um, one of the things I wanted to do with the book was, I, I, I can't tell you if it's a good or bad book, I, I can't judge my own writing, but what I wanted to do was get at the idea that you can understand why somebody does something, even something terrible, without necessarily taking their side which I think is a notion that, at least in this part of the world, has been obliterated over the last 16 years, right? This, this notion that you can understand why somebody does something without taking their side. Uh, and so most of the book follows essentially the radicalization of Surat Chestnut. It follows how we, we, first we meet this very curious, loving six-year-old girl. We follow her over the course of her life. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not a spoiler to say that this book ends with a fairly horrific act. And that was the, the part with which I was least concerned. What I wanted was to show the work of how somebody gets to that place. And that's, that's essentially what the book is about. I find it really interesting you talk about um, wanting, to sh you know, wanting to really bring up this notion of how do we um, not sympathize with someone, but understand again where they're coming from, why they may have chosen the routes they've chosen without necessarily validating the routes, rather than saying, oh, that's okay that you did that, but saying, well, okay, I understand the conditions. And when I was reading this book, I was really fascinated with how you actually didn't bring in ideology, values, issues <coughs> that we are dealing with, that many places are dealing with around um, ideology of race, um, ideology of faith, ideo you know, these ideologies of values that then kind of force people into um, taking sides or making different choices. Rather, you're really looking at what does, what does, how does one condition, how does one situation lead to someone making a decision and then being in another situation? What are the choices within that situation that they then take? And can you talk a little bit about your training or your work as a journalist and kind of, I mean, for me, I thought, oh, this must be his very journalistic eye, really looking at, you know, you were here, this thing happened. Um, it was beyond your control, and so what did you do after this thing happened, you know? Yeah, so um, I, was, I was a journalist for 10 years. Um, I, I went to work at the Globe and Mail, uh, which is Canada's national paper, uh, and I went there on a summer internship the year I got out of college. That was my first job, and I was there for 10 years. Um, and right after my summer internship ended, I, um, this is a tangential story, I apologize in advance. <laughs> Um, they, I joined, uh, they hired me on full-time at the end of that summer. Um, I started work on a Monday, and I think on that Friday, Canada had the biggest terrorism arrests in Canadian history. It's called the Toronto 18 case. It was these 18 kids, and some of them were kids, some of them were teenagers, who had all these grandiose plans of uh, beheading the Prime Minister, blowing up Parliament Hill, so on and so forth. They got nowhere with it. Um, the, the spy agencies were watching them the whole time. Um, so they arrest these kids, it's the biggest story in the world for about a week. The New York Times comes up, CNN comes up, and the Globe and the Mail gets beat on, on the story. We, didn't, we had, a, we had a, a, a brief on page two. It was front page of every other paper in the country. Um, and so the editor-in-chief has an all-hands-on-deck meeting the next day. He brings in an entire newsroom of about 300, and he's looking around for anybody who has, he's looking around for anybody who has any background in Islam, or the Middle East, which is where these kids and some of their parents come from. He's looking for brown people, right? Newsroom of 300, he finds two. He finds me, I've been there for th four days, and he finds the theater critic, who just happens to be a brown guy. So he says, you two, you're gonna go to the mosques that these kids went to on the outskirts of Toronto, you're gonna, you're gonna do some beat reporting, you're gonna, do, you're gonna hit the streets, you're gonna talk to people, you're gonna, okay, sure, that's, that's what I do, you know, I'm a, I'm a daily reporter. So he sends me out to one mosque, he sends the theater critic out to the other, I come back, I'm writing, theater critic comes back, gives me his file, 
and it's about 500 words on the color of the drapes <laughs> and the ambiance of the completely useless, beautifully written, completely useless. Um, this is my roundabout way of saying the next two years of my life were spent on that story. It was spent on the story of these kids and, and how you go from being, essentially, some, some of them were born in Canada, and, and how you go from being the most average high school kid in the world to trying to build a detonator from YouTube videos, right? And so that, that, that idea of radicalization was my life for a long time and trying to understand it. And so that, that plays a central role in, in this story. But then later on, I went and covered the war in Afghanistan. I was, I was there in, in Kandahar on two stints. Uh, I did eight trips to Guantanamo Bay to cover the military trials there. Um, I covered the Arab Spring. I covered the Black Lives Matter movement in, in Ferguson. Um, and a lot of that stuff sort of finds its way into, into the book, um, sometimes in terms of symmetry. Um, so the one thing I, I go back to a lot is I was a journalist for 10 years. I was tear gassed twice. I was tear gassed when I was in Cairo covering the Arab, uh, the Arab Spring and when I was in Ferguson covering the Black Lives Matter movement. And that's not to say that being in one of those places somehow imbues a, an understanding of the other, simply that a lot of the visual language was the same. Um, the, the very militarized police presence. Um, this, a population that had reached such a level of, of just no longer being able to bear what, what they've been put through that they had to resist. And that resistance being met with this incredibly false dichotomy of equating the, the, the damage of property with the damage of lives as though those were two equal and offsetting things. A lot of these things had echoes. A lot of them felt the same in, in certain ways. So that, that also plays into, into the book. And interesting when you're talking about um, these echoes, you know, you, you talked earlier that um, you were writing this in 2015. Um, and so kind of the things that are really have come really up in America, have really come up in our discourse and in our politics, we're still kind of bubbling under the surface enough that we could say, well, maybe not, or, you know, mm, that's kind of, that's still kind of crazy. Um, yet I'm reading this book, and I was reading this book um, the week, I was, while I was reading this book, the weekend of Charlottesville happened um, just last week. Um, we have all these hurricanes hitting Texas, hitting uh, Florida, which in your novel is erased, <laughs> is now under the water. Um, and so it was really, it was really curious for me to see these things not only not not as premonitions so much, um, other than you know okay you describe a refugee camp you have these in the in the south where where um, the south is seceded you have these drones that have been kind of um, taken out of commission except they still fly around and, and they still cause random damage so they're no longer being directed by whoever set them on their initial mission um, but they're just randomly shooting down people or things or, um, and it reminds me of, of course, you know, the videos that we see where the wedding party is shot down and uh, X, Y, and Z. So these things that are very familiar to me in terms of international phenomenon, right, international milita military phenomenon are, is now happening in a very particular American context. So can you just talk about that, bringing, you know, just these echoes? Yeah. I, the. The book was completed, the manuscript was completed, um, I think about two or three weeks before Donald Trump announced he was running for, for president. Um, and to give you a sense of how little of this I predicted, um, my German publisher asked, they asked a bunch of their uh, US-based authors to, to write uh, blog posts on the night of the election on their feeling of, of what, you know, what was happening. And so I started writing around 8 p.m. Uh, and around 1 a.m. I had to delete everything I'd written and start from scratch. That's how certain I was that Buddy wasn't going to win. Um, so, to, so the idea of this as prophecy is, is meaningless. It was not my intention at all. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of things here that echo in, in American culture right now, not because I predicted where America was going to go, but because America is not immune to the sort of forces that, that any other country or any other people might go through. Um, you know, this is, <laughs> so the reason, the reason it has this cover, um, there were, they went through, uh, I think 50 or 60 cover designs and they settled on this one. Um, I've gotten yelled at about this cover a lot because it's not, it doesn't pop, it's not. Almost all of the other 50 had, um, various versions of American flags in distress, burning American flags, melting American flags, stylized American flags. 
and I, I kept saying, well, I didn't, I, this is not a book about America. I, I never intended it to be a book about America, and so we settled on, um, on something that has, you know, it has the stars and the barbed wire, but that's about it for, you know. Um, it, was no, yeah, it was never my intention to write a book about, about this country. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could see the change, right? Like you could see this moment where, especially in the, in the election, most elections are about who's gonna steer the ship and in which direction they're gonna steer it. And suddenly you had this election where a huge portion of the electorate seemed to think that the ship was sinking. And, and you, had, you had, of the three major candidates, you had one candidate saying, well, we'll put some duct tape here, we'll put some duct tape there and it'll, it'll be fine. Another one saying, we're gonna tear the ship down completely and build a new, more equitable ship. And then a third guy saying, there's lifeboats for me, there's lifeboats for everybody who looks like me, everybody else better learn to swim. And it was, you just, you make rash decisions under those, under those circumstances, and now we live in the sort of the, the consequences of that. Um, but the notion of, of having this book come out in, in 2017 and it being seen purely through the lens of plausibility is a very terrifying thing. It might be good for book sales. I haven't checked the sales numbers. It might be, you know, great for that. But, you know, as a brown Muslim guy living in America, do I want this to become, you know, an establishment? No, of course not. It's, it's, that was never, that was never the intention. Yeah, and for me, the interesting thing really, again, isn't about um, can it happen, will it happen, but really about, um, for me, really, again, looking at the, the military um, side of it that, that you talked about, and that the fact that the things that we have been practicing, you know, in our military and as a nation can very easily and throughout history have been used against our own citizenry. And we haven't always known about that. And we haven't always talked about that. And it reminds me post 9-11 of the solo show that I did was really trying to ask people, well, what happens when we start to accept, you know, the, a government surveillance system and a self-surveillance system yes. saying that, oh, it's going to keep us safe from them? Um, when, when, when will you be the them? You know, at what point will, will you be the them, you know? And um, Devesh talked yesterday about the Indians being the new American 1% or the unseen 1%. And we never thought that we would be the them, right? That our class or our education would keep us safe. Um, yet many Indians, many South Asians um, were rounded up post 9-11 in arbitrary detentions that were extrajudicial, that had no legal uh, they had no legal representation and for months and months they were in you know um, god knows where actually no one knows where um so it was very interesting for me to see what happens if that's even scaled up you know if we take it to another level we really start using um weaponry we start using drones against one another yeah i mean the, the central this is this is something that borges once said about about the idea that all literature is basically tricks and that no matter how good the author is, um, eventually the tricks get found out. You know, it, it, and he was talking about much, much better authors than I am, but, but the, the, the point remains that the central trick in this book is not particularly elaborate. I took the things that happened all the way over there, and I brought them over here. The thesis statement being that the people over there, over there are not suffering in some kind of exotic or unique way. We just have the privilege of believing that because we haven't been on the losing end of a war. Uh, for you know, decades at a time, as, as maybe Afghanistan or you know, um, but we see the the reverse of this all of the time, to the point that it's not even it's not even something that we consciously think of. I mean, think of any any James Bond movie you've ever seen. There's always at least one or two scenes in, in an exotic Caribbean island, or uh, a Moroccan bazaar, and it's scenery, right? It's there to be deliberately exotic. It's it's the table on which somebody else's tablecloth is being laid. You know, we're not used to the opposite of that. We're not used to this part of the world being the table and somebody else's tablecloth being on top of it, right? And that's what, you know, it makes it feel rare or unique in that sense, but the central trick is not particularly unique. We do, we do this all the time. And the fact that we don't do it in the reverse is, is doubly frustrating because if there's any country that's well suited for the telling of other people's stories, it's, it's this country, right? Um, so that's really all I did. And, and the militarization aspect of it is, you know, the, what I was interested in there was, was um, the idea of what being on the losing end of a war does. Um, so the book is set in 2075, but it's set almost primarily in, in the South. The South has lost the war. And so a lot of people picked it up thinking it was a sort of futuristic book. Um, and then they sort of came and complained that there was no futurist, nobody's on hoverboards yeah, here, this is, right. it's not happening. In fact, it feels less futuristic than, than the present day. 
Um, and that has to do with this idea of, of when you lose a war, it's akin to moving backwards in time. You know, not just in terms of your infrastructure getting wiped out, but also in terms of everybody constantly looking backwards to a time when it wasn't this bad. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of what's happening in this book. So um, Arson, who's a bookseller, was asking me yesterday as I was, I was talking to him, um, he pointed out 2075, and he wanted to know why, why did you choose that date? Was it a deliberate thought to set it in that particular year? It was purely pragmatic for two reasons. Um, so in the book, the sea levels have risen, um, and they've risen much more than anybody expects them to rise in, in that amount of time. Um, they've wiped out the eastern seaboard, Florida's gone, so on and so forth. Um, and so I needed, I needed time for that to happen. Um, the other element of it is, in, in this world, there is a rising uh, rival empire. It's called the Boazizi Empire, and it's basically the Middle East and North Africa have coalesced into this pan-Arab, utopian, democratic empire that I don't think will ever happen, but one can be optimistic. Um, that's the futuristic part. That's the very <laughs> futuristic part. Um, so it is the way it works, it, there's been five springs. There's been four more Arab springs, and finally on the fifth one they got it to work. And, and, you know. um, and so I needed time for these things to happen. Um, it felt like it would have been more of a sci-fi novel if I had said it in 2020. Um, you know. Um, but beyond that, it was, it was never my intention of, uh, to, 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 to write a futuristic novel. There's that thing that Orson Scott, Scott Card, is that his name? The guy who wrote Ender's Game, um, had said about how you, how you distinguish a, a, a sci-fi book from a fantasy book. Uh, he said, you look at the cover, and if the cover has bolts and rivets and metal, it's a sci-fi book. And if it has trees and streams and a forest, it's a fantasy book. Um, some people saw set in 2075, and they thought, oh, okay, cool, futuristic. You know, like they, they, they thought it was something, but it's, it's not that. Well, Arson seemed to say that 2075 is almost um, equidistant from now as the 60s were from now. So he thought there was something there. There, there was a couple of references. To, I mean, almost everything in the book, I spoke about this a bit yesterday, is, is the, the references in the book are, are analogies for the most part. Um, and so one of the questions I got from people who read it as a sort of literal American story was, it's not realistic that, this, that the next civil war would be fought over climate change, it's gonna be fought over race. Um, and in, in my book, climate change was analogous. It was, it was an analogy for something else, an analogy for that kind of stubbornness of I don't care who this hurts, this benefits me, and we've always done it, so we're gonna do it. Um, the other element was I couldn't see a second civil war being fought over race because I can't see the first one ending. You know, that, that, that's still happening right now. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 almost everything in the book references something else. And some of these are, are, were, in my mind, fairly overt references, but got overtaken by, by um, events, I got overtaken by the world. Um, for example, there's a refugee camp in, in this book uh, called uh, Camp Patience. And the events that take place in Camp Patience are very much based on uh, events that took place in Sobran Shatila, which is a refugee camp in the Middle East. Um, you know, sabra, sabra is the Arabic word for patience. When the Arabic translation of this book comes out in a few months, that's going to be a really overt reference to what I'm talking about, but it gets, it sort of hides in the, in the English version. Um, so there's a little bit of that as it relates to, uh, that's the closest I come to, to any kind of commentary on American society is done sort of in an analogous sense. So are you trying to get Americans to, to shatter that notion of exceptionalism? I genuinely wouldn't care um, if it wasn't that. There's a line in the book where, where uh, one of the characters says everyone fights an American war. You know, if this was just any other country, I believe in whatever exceptionalism you want. That's great. I've heard I've heard worse national myths. You know, it's just that the volume of this country is very loud, and the repercussions of everything that happens here, everything this country does, uh, is very loud. Um, so in that sense, that I, I had that in the back of my mind when I was writing this book. Um, but, but, I mean, fundamentally what I'm talking about is, is, and authors harp about this all the time, and it sounds cliche, but I'm talking about empathy, right? I'm talking about the idea that all good literature is basically weaponized empathy, right? It's, it's, it's someone shaking you and saying, feel on this person's behalf, you know? <laughs> um, and, and that's what this is. I mean, this country, the majority of its wars in, in its sort of 
the modern era, certainly the time that I've been alive, um, have been fought far away. Um, and, and you had an apex of, of distance of the person living here from the wars that were being fought on their behalf. Um, and it, it's this apex, the apex was reached essentially in Vietnam, where you suddenly had footage. You had, you had visceral images of what a war is, what it does to people. And there's a reaction to that. Once you see what this is, you have, to, you have to feel about it a different way. And I thought that that trend line would continue, but instead it's gone in the other direction. You look at f war footage now, and what you're seeing is something that looks like it comes out of a Call of Duty game. Mm -hmm. You know, you see this grainy footage of something that may be a bomb, but is really just five pixels, and it falls in a grainy sort of, it doesn't feel human at all, right? And, and, and I'm always worried about that distance. It makes it a lot easier to do things that A, are terrible on their face, but also have much worse consequences down the road. Um, and so part of the, the writing of this book had to do with, with trying to close that distance again. So on whose behalf are you shaking the American reader? Is it the war victims? No, um, and it's not, a, it's not really on behalf of anyone. Um, one of the interesting things that have happened when I talk to people who read, who read this book is that by the end of the book, they're much more sympathetic to Surat Chestnut than I am. Um, you know, in my mind, by the end of the book, she is a fundamentally evil person. Um, and so I'm not advocating on her behalf. Um, you know, all I wanted to get at was the why. You know, when we see people who've been radicalized, when we see people who've done something horrible, like in, that, in that train of horribleness, we see them at the finish line, right? We see whatever terrible thing they've done and will be remembered for. We very rarely see the rest of the race. Right? And so this book is essentially a fictionalized rest of the race. It's what everything that came before. And by the end, I don't want you to uh, sympathize with her. I don't want you to apologize for her. I don't even want you to like her. I just want you to understand how she got to the place where she is. Because if we're seriously interested in, in solving the sort of pro problems that are related to radicalization, we have to stop creating the conditions for more radicalization. And that means understanding what it is that someone goes through before they become a monster. It's not a, you know, that's not a, uh, an innovative thought on my part. It's just something that we seem to deliberately avoid. Okay, let's go from the world back into the book for a second. And you have in between the chapters um, uh, what you've made up, kind of these documents that are government documents from the archives, from um, uh, whether they're redacted kind of um, torture and, and other government documents, whether they're kind of treaties and agreements about how things will proceed after a certain uh, agreement has been reached. What function do you see those kind of government documents playing in the narrative? Yeah, it started out, so the chapters are split with these official sounding documents, oral histories, um, letters from governors, and so on and so forth. Um, and it started out as a crutch for me as a writer. Um, I, had this, I had this world with a lot of moving parts, and um, I couldn't keep track of all of them. And since I have 10 years of experience as a journalist, I have 10 years of experience with, with official documents. And so I started writing these things to keep track of the world. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll use like a paragraph of one or another. Someone will quote it in the narrative or whatever. Um, it was only later on that I, that I found that there was something really interesting about actually including these things in there. Um, and the, the one I always go back to is um, in, in the sort of second half of the book, one of the official documents is a letter from a detainee at Sugarloaf. Sugarloaf is a detention camp, very obviously based on Guantanamo Bay. Um, this is a letter from a detainee to his family members, um, but it's gone through the censors. Um, and so when you pick it up, when you actually look at it, it's mostly just blacked out, just black lines. Um, so, you know, today I was taken to blank, and then paragraph of blank, and so on and so forth. Uh, Dion Graham, when he reads the audiobook, when he gets to those parts, he just says redacted. And by the end of the letter, he's just saying the word redacted over and over again. It has this really numbing effect. It's, um, it's, it's really surreal to hear. Um, that's not something I could have done. That's an element of texture that I couldn't have gotten into a straightforward narrative. Um, so that's why I kept them. They've been a fairly polarizing part of the book because you know, I'll go, I'll go to, to books or readings and some people say, well, they're, they're too dry. It's like, yeah, they're, they're intended to be dry. The government documents are intended to say nothing. That's kind of the, the you know. Um, and if I wanted to stay true to the sort of bureaucratic language of a lot of these documents, which is why they're very short, which is why they're about a page each. Um, but they were intended to get at this idea of, of, of the way we clean all this mess up. 
which is through euphemism and through sort of you know official sounding nonsense. Well, I found them interesting, and actually I didn't find them dry. I found them because you are so concentrated in the South, in Surratt's story, in you know her pain and her journey, that this brings you out of that a little to say, okay, what else is happening around? You know, so what was happening in this governmental level when the two sides were trying to reconcile? And what were they talking about? And then you go into her story and you see what are the rebels, what are the people on the ground who've, you know, fought and, um, uh, you know, what, what's it called when you, you sacrifice for, for the cause and, and you're losing. And so other people are making decisions about how to accept the loss. Yet these people who have been told, like, you know, you must sacrifice and you must win this and you're our fighters are, you know, are here kind of cursing out their own government and cursing out the northern government. Um, so I found these documents really great, um, almost like a little dialogue was happening. I could understand, oh, okay, what's happening up here that sometimes we don't have say over these politicians who are making these decisions, yet here are the people who are kind of acting out their lives inside those decisions. Yeah, it was, I mean, for me it was also a way to, to sneak in certain references that, that, I, that I couldn't do otherwise. For example, there's a, one of the documents is a, is a compensation document. Um, I spent some time when I was in Afghanistan, I was talking to the compensation officers. And these are people who are essentially, it's actuarial mathematics for violence. You know, uh, this bomb was supposed to land here, it landed here, it killed this person's entire livestock. It destroyed. Well, we look at the sheet, the sheet says you pay them this much. Um, or this has happened a second time, we think they're not telling the truth. Or, you know, they, they sort of, it's basically cold hard math applied to the um, the sort of uh, the, the collateral damage or whatever the euphemism is. Um, Life. Well, yeah, right, um, exactly. Um, and so one of the documents is that. It's a compensation document, and, and it has the names of, of the victims of, of what happened, the amount that they're, that they're paid, um, and then right next to each one I, I wrote um, FA or pre-FA. And I never describe what FA stands for, but it stands for fighting age which is a reference to something the previous administration, I'm pretty sure the current administration has done, which is designate essentially any male between the ages of, I forget, 14 and 60 or whatever it is, as a fighter. And then the onus is on them to, so if you drop a bomb in the, in the wrong part of town, um, the victims then have to prove that they weren't fighters because the, the, the sort of, the definitions, the default is that virtually anyone is an enemy combatant. And then the onus is on you to prove you're not. Um, you know, it took me, what, like five minutes to describe that, just talking about it, um, but then you, you at least can, can, can sort of get at these things in a different way. It's really effective, and the, the document, I mean, I found them really effective to, to just bring me into this whole world. Um, so let's open it up a little bit. I know um, folks are probably percolating on a lot of different threads of this conversation. Um, let's, what we'll do is we'll gather a few questions and comments, and then... Uh, Omar will talk about them, and then we'll do another round and another round. Um, all right, so let's start here and then there. Uh, yeah, I have not read the book. Uh, but I, on the face of it, I don't believe there's going to be a civil war. But I think probably everybody in this room believes that by 2075, things are going to change and probably for the worse. Um, you were interviewing uh, Kim yesterday about North Korea. You said you liked it. You, you read it carefully. There's a, lot of, North Korea. <laughs> there's a lot of detailed information that you could use to reimagine what this country might more be like by 2075. Are you gathering, I, if, you, if we don't have a civil war, are you gathering information about an alternative disaster? OK, let's hold that, so. <laughs> um, I, was, I was struck by one of the most influential books I am interested in whether or not you might have been uh, inspired or got the idea from uh, the John Dos Passos trilogy, USA. And he had what my professor referred to as interchapters. And these would be documents, uh, uh, brief biographies of 
uh, uh, excerpts from the newsreels that we once had before we saw the movie. And I, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful device. I'm so glad you're using it. I love that, that whole trilogy, and I look forward to reading your book. Thank you. Any, any one or two others? Yes. Uh, if you could just expand again, it is the premise of the book just, um, you said it was fossil fuels and then the South seceding. Is it just that, or are you compiling all the potential, uh, you know, where all, all the, the, the things we're not tackling in the world today, whether it is this, whether it is actual nuclear pro proliferation, are you putting all those in to say, here are the problems we face in 2017, we're not tackling them effectively, and this is how life will evolve if we continue to be like this. Okay, and one more down here, and then we'll do a second round. Um, my mother's from the South, and the Civil War for them is at halftime. <laughs> yeah, are you seriously? Um, at halftime. At halftime. There's a picture on our mantle which my great grandmother hid the money. My grandfather, anyway, it's a long story, but. It, it had union money in it, and it represents our rebuilding of the family. So in your years as a journalist, um, there are these deep-seated hates that you must have seen in your reporting that just go generation way past the time. And I wonder if you could talk about that a bit. I've taken <laughs> So what's going to happen because of my terrible memories? I'm going to answer something close to all of your questions, but, but somewhat. Um, so about the idea of, of compiling future disasters. Um, is that your theme? The, the short answer is no. Um, the short answer is this book is not at all concerned with the future. Everything in this book happened. It just happened to somebody else who doesn't have much of a voice. Um, and I passed it through a grotesque lens, but I didn't invent drone killings, and I didn't invent waterboarding. I didn't invent refugee camps. Um, so the idea of future disasters, I'm probably not going to be alive in 2075. Someone else's problem. Um, what I'm concerned with is, is that the, the, the central myth of this country that I was fed living on the other side of the planet, that that work. Um, cause my, name, my name, when I was introduced, is o Omar al -Akkad. It's not really Omar al -Akkad. It's Omar Muhammad Laed, um, Egyptian born. Um, and I, I grew up on, on the diet of American culture that, was, that fed me an idea of this country as fundamentally a place where you could go and be left alone, to think what you want and to say what you want and do what you want. Having come here, I realized that that is wildly off limits to many, many communities in this, in this country. Um, nonetheless, coming from a part of the world where you can't say what you want and you can't do what you want and you're not left alone, it's really important for me that that work. Um, and so this isn't some sort of you know, wish fulfillment of Americans killing each other. It's, it, I, 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 I thought I understood this country from a distance, and I didn't. I've been living here for four years now, and every morning I wake up and realize that I don't at all. Um, and that there exists this massive chasm between what the mainstream of this country believes this country to be and what it really is and that we, we largely live in that chasm and in the violence of that chasm. Um, so I'm not interested in, in future scenarios of, of destruction. I'm interested in preventing the ongoing destruction. Now, you know, I'm interested in at least acknowledging it, um, which, is, which is something that is very difficult here. You know, The issue of, of, of cops beating up and killing black people did not suddenly coincide with the proliferation of, of cell phone cameras. You know, that the, the, the issue of acknowledgement in this country is, is, is serious and ongoing. Um, so that's my very roundabout way of saying that I'm not particularly concerned with the next thing that could go wrong. Those, uh, I haven't read it. Uh, I've been told about it. Um, I, 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 I'm waiting to read it. Uh, it's, on, it's on the list. The book that, in, that inspired me the most when I was writing this is a book called Let Us Now Praise Famous Men which has nothing to do with, with the Soviets. It's, 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 it's a beautiful doorstop of a book, um, and, and borderline unreadable in parts, but it, it has to do with um, uh, the writer being asked by a magazine, I think in the 20s or 30s, to go down and, and write a, a feature on, on sharecropping families in the South. Um, and he goes down, uh, James Agee. 
And he, and he goes down there and he spends months living with these families, comes back to the magazine. Instead of a feature, he has 500, words, uh, 500 pages of text. And they say, we can't use this. We're a magazine. You can't. And so instead, he publishes the book. But, but the, what stuck with me was his attention to, to very um, minor details uh, of a life that doesn't have much voice. You know, these are people who don't have much say. They don't have much agency. And he'll spend 10 pages describing a bedroom in a house and describing the, the, the way the photographs are placed. And, you know, um, so that was the book that influenced me the most when I was writing this. What about um, generational hate? I think we spoke a little to your question about all issues. Combined. It's not clear to me because I haven't really read enough of the book to figure out the direction of it. So are you just talking civil war because of this particular issue? Or are you encompassing other things that are going on in the world and are not being effectively tackled? I, was, I, I chose civil war because it was the, the most visceral, the closest form of warfare. Um, you know, the, the, the issue I was addressing when I started writing the book had to do with, um, with the privilege of distance, right? I mean, these things are happening all the way over there. We can imagine whatever we want about that. Um, and, and to get at that, to get at that issue, I had to think of the opposite of that. And the opposite of that, the closest I could come to was a civil war where you're fighting yourself. Um, one of the things that I find really fascinating about this country, I was driving, I was doing a story in Miami about climate change, and I had a few extra days on my hands, so I drove up um, into Georgia to do a story about a town called Kennesaw, just outside Atlanta, where there's a law in the books that says every household needs to own a gun. Um, completely symbolic, unenforceable, unconstitutional, etc., but they have it on, it's a statement law. Um, anyway, so I'm driving up. And I get past the Florida Georgia line, and, and um, the first billboard I see on the side of the road just says in big letters, secede. It doesn't even say, like, visit our website. It doesn't say anything. It just says secede, right? And it was interesting to me that the stories survived the war that the stories caused. You know, I mean, Japan symbolically can't have a standing army. Germany has incredibly tight restrictions on imagery related to the Third Reich and the Nazi Party. Um, the losing side of a war tends to have conditions imposed on their stories to keep them from reprompting that. But when you're fighting yourself, somehow that doesn't apply. The stories all survived. Not only survived, but when we're talking about these Confederate monuments, we're not talking about things that were built in the 1860s, we're talking about things that were built in the 1960s. And they were built for a very different reason. Um, so I was interested in that idea of, of why stories survive, and the closest I could come to an explanation was because the person you're fighting looks and sounds like you. And so you're willing to give them tons more leeway. And by doing that, like I said, I mean, you couldn't, you know, the first Civil War never feels like, like it ended. The story survived. Um, so that, that was the thinking behind, behind a, a Civil War as opposed to a foreign conflict. Does that kind of talk to the generational? Yeah hate the story transmissions. And it isn't, it isn't like a kitchen sink of all the issues, it's, it's very, very specific. Um, okay, uh, another round of comments, thoughts, questions. One here, one up there. Well, okay, um, this is a question that I, I would hope you could answer, but I think it's a question that I'm really asking myself, that maybe all of us should think of our own answer. You said that uh, the premise of the book was um, getting to a point where we understand the heinousness of where, uh, we understand where a person has come from who commits heinousness. And, and also you mentioned that, that many novelists are we using weaponized empathy. Yeah, okay, so I think that kind of correlates with, with this. So to, to get to that point where you understand where that person came from, but you don't, like you said, you don't have to necessarily agree with it or go along with it. Then what? So you understand it. So what? Then what? Thank you. Yes, sir? Uh, um, my question is somewhat similar to this, is if you think of it as trajectories of, of radicalization, and you look at it in the global current climate context and the sets of pressures that are going to be emerging globally, and you think 50 years down the road, what are the points of entry where you could actually have a change in those narratives so that you avoid some of those trajectories? The understanding being central, but as you said, you can't change them without understanding them, but hindsight is 2020. We've got a little chance of foresight. 
Where, what does one do? Okay. Did I see a hand over it? One and two? Just out of curiosity, how does the rest of the world look like in your novel? How does what? How does the rest of the world look oh, like ah, in your novel? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope we'll all read the novel soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But first of all, thank you for telling that story. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, you said you're not familiar with the sales department, <laughs> but are you seeing like uh, more and more interest in Akhtal's plays and his American Dervish and disgrace getting traction, Ed Hussein's The Islamist may have been something, are you seeing that story being more, having more receptivity? Thank you. Um, so the, the answer of, of the first two questions is going to be incredibly disappointing, and I apologize in advance. Um, you know, what happens next? Maybe nothing. Um, what I do know is that taking the alternate route, what happens next is certainly nothing. Which is to say, once you go about trying to understand somebody who's not you, um, you can then maybe go on to find solutions to the problems between you and someone who's not you. Maybe you won't. But that's the prerequisite. You know, it's, it's the prerequisite. Um, I mean, I can only speak to this kind, to this idea from, from, from you know, my own experience. So, so for example, um, I grew up on American popular culture, right? Um, descriptions of, of, of Muslim people in, in American popular culture, there's three, right? There's the bad guy, who's a terrorist. There's the good guy who helps Jack Bauer catch the terrorist. And then there's the Moroccan fruit vendor whose stall is destroyed in a car chase scene, right? That's it. It's, it's the one spectrum, and, and you exist along that, that binary, right? Um, you know, if there are more equitable descriptions in pop culture of, of people who aren't straight white guys, is that suddenly going to solve the, the wars in the Middle East? No. But it's a prerequisite. Um, it's, it's the first thing you can do. I mean, we, you know, you, you do these events and, and, and you, you naturally get people who ask for solutions. Um, and it's always a really dangerous time when you're asking a writer of fiction for solutions, right? I mean, that's, that shows you the sort of the state of the world. Um, but, but a prerequisite for the solutions is, for example, in the context of this country, is believe your minority communities when they tell you about systemic injustice, right? That's, once you do that, maybe you'll find that it's, it's, the whole thing needs to be dismantled to fix it, and that's too much work, and you know, maybe nothing will come of that, but certainly nothing will come of it going down the other road, which is just this sort of deliberate ununderstanding. And um, uh, you can speak to the increased interest of this book because it's a topic of nature of what's going on and how the rest of the world Sure, um, let's start with the rest of the world. Um, so, in, in the book, um, there's rival empires. Um, you know, China, the Russian Empire has sort of reemerged. Um, the one that is most fictional is this Boazizi Empire, which is Middle East and North Africa has coalesced into this democratic empire. Um, the creation story that I used to, to come up with that is essentially the US creation story. A number of people from different backgrounds rise up against perceived tyranny, uh, and from a number of different states, they create one. So I just applied that creation story to, to the Middle East. Um, there are, from these rival empires, um, essentially saboteurs. So there's a, a central character in this book is, is a member of the Boazizi Empire who is effectively uh, living in the U.S. and trying to prolong the civil war as long as possible because for one empire to rise, another must fall, and so that's the, the role. Uh, and that's based effectively on something like American involvement uh, during the Russian invasion of Afghanistan which is, you know, the other empire is in a quagmire, we're gonna try and prolong it from a distance, uh, so maybe we'll sell these stingers to the Mujahideen if that comes back to bite us in the ass a few decades later, well, it's someone else's problem. Um, so that's effectively what the rest of the world looks like now, um, is one empire is in decline and others are rising. Um, as for increased interest in the book, I should preface by saying that when I wrote this book, I had no agent and no publisher and no expectation that it would ever see the light of day, so everything has been a bonus um, <laughs> since, since then. Um, it's, it's been, um, it's been or is being translated into, I think, about 12 languages now is where we are. That sounds far more impressive than it, than it actually is, I should say. Um, <laughs> translation rights are like 50 bucks and, and, so, and you, know, you sell, you sell three copies in, in Poland and, and that's great, but, um, it's mostly just an ego thing. Um, 
uh, there was some interest in, in the film rights. Um, this is this is a somewhat interesting story. So because I know nothing about film rights and TV rights are much, much more complicated than a publishing contract. A publishing contract is you have a book, you meet a publisher, the publisher likes your book, you sign a contract, done. Um, with film and TV, there's various investors and productions, and they, can you sign a screenwriter on board, and can you whatever. Um, and because I didn't know any of this world, I asked, I asked for two things. Um, I asked that the, the racial background of the characters be respected in, in the characters you play them. So like, Surat Chestnut isn't being played by Taylor Swift or something like that. Um, and that they not declaw it. You know, it's, it's a fairly grim book. It has a fairly grim ending. Um, and that's not a spoiler that's pretty clear from the get-go. Um, and I didn't want to, you know, turn on TV five years from now and see American Peace. You know, so those are the two things I asked for. And a number of the production companies dropped out. They wouldn't, they, they were like, no, that's not, that's not what we're going for. Um, I think, you know, it comes out in a moment where, where it's timely. Yeah. Um, timely books aren't necessarily good. I'm looking forward to the day when all of this is over one way or another and it gets measured on different merits. Um, you know, and I get a review that doesn't mention the Trump era or doesn't mention, you know, the moment we're in. Um, you know, may, maybe people will like it or hate it, I don't know, but at least then it'll, it won't be in this incredibly strange spotlight that we're in. Okay, let's take another round and then we have to probably end. So. As you said, the books got a lot of attention because of the times, but you actually wrote it before the election. So I'm looking, I'm flashing back, so you wrote it during the Obama administration. Uh, and you've talked about empathy with uh, other people. So one of the things that at least Obama represented when he, when he, when he took office in 2008 was a call for this empathy, including with the Muslim world in going to Cairo. So um, was you writing this book also a reflection on a disillusionment with maybe some of the, what Obama had, op had hoped to achieve and of course for various reasons then, you know, dissipated and, and was tiny? Or, or is this something that would be independent of even that one moment of hope where uh, maybe things could be different? Thanks. Yes, sir. So um, my question is, um, we've seen some of the books that help us try to understand people who commit heinous crimes, like serial murderers and unit bombers. And there are society reasons, there are personal family reasons, psychologies. Uh, have you, I mean, in your book or in your research, explore the, all these areas, or is that more focus on the society? So we'll start with the translator. And in most cases, I, I don't know. Um, a, you know for example, um, we sold the Portuguese rights in, in Portugal, and then we sold the Portuguese rights in Brazil. So apparently there's going to be two different Portuguese versions of it. So I, I couldn't tell you at all. Um, I had this surreal experience of doing an interview in, German, um, or in Germany with a German reporter who was asking me about a quote from a book. So the, the book was translated into German. She read the German, read it back to me, translated it into English again. So it was like sort of going through Google Translate five or six times. So I had to, in my head, try to figure out what the original was, because it had been translated three times. Um, the only one that I could reasonably, um, that I could reasonably take a stab at is the Arabic translation. Um, and that one, I actually, as part of the contract, I asked for veto rights. So they're gonna send me a copy, I'm gonna read it in Arabic. My Arabic is terrible, but I can still get by. Um, and I didn't ask just because that's the one language I speak, it's because uh, I didn't know if they were gonna censor certain things. Um, you know, the, the Arabic language market is, is sketchy at best. Um, so, for the most part, I, and also, I'm, I'm, and I feel the same way about, about film or TV rights. I, I want someone else to take this and make it their own art. You know, uh, translation is, is an art. Um, and the best translations are more concerned with, with the destination than the source. You know, the ones that try to really stay true to the source tend to be clunky, really clunky. Um, you know, I'm thinking of something like, I mean, the, 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 the King James Bible stays, is, is really concerned with, 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 with the source and staying true to the source. And there's certain phrases that are, just sound clunky, which sound beautiful in the original, and, and this is very off track, I'm sorry. Um, but but, um, but it, I, I like the idea of this being the basis for somebody else's art, because that, that somebody is almost certainly more talented at what they do than I am at what I do. So same thing was true with the audiobook. 
you know, I, I, I didn't want to go over it and say, no, well, I would have done this differently because the person doing it is much better than me. So, um, so I've been glad to sort of let it live its own life. <laughs> so one of the source documents in, in the book is a speech that the leader of the Boazizi Empire, the leader of the Boazizi Empire comes to the U.S. during the middle of the Civil War and gives a speech. And it's, it's a fairly empty speech about how everybody must be responsible for their own uplifting, the, the sort of stuff that every world leader gives all of the time. And, and it's based in part on Obama's Cairo speech, which was a very sweet sounding thing. Um, but sort of belied the, the, the reality of, of the U.S. constantly supporting whoever's going to keep things quiet, regardless of, of what their background is. Um, I should say, I mean, as far as are my political leanings, I think Barack Obama was one of the best presidents this country ever elected, and I, I don't know if I lose half the room or gain half the room or whatever, I don't care. Um, and I, I also think that, that you we're currently living through the repercussions of that, and the repercussions of the fact that a black man was an excellent president um, I don't think Donald Trump gets elected otherwise. You know, I think, that, but that's that's my political leanings, and that's fine. That's, you know, um, the the Obama administration was on my mind here because a it was the administration that was in power at the time, but b there were certain things that were happening that I was happy to let someone like Barack Obama take take a leadership role on, but I was worried about what came next. You know, like the, in the book, there are these things called the birds. And the birds are the, these drones that the North uses to fly over the South and drop bombs. And at one point, somebody destroys the server farm that controls these things. So when the book takes place, the birds are just flying around randomly and they're dropping their cargo wherever. And people are just looking up at the sky and getting superstitious whenever they see a, a, a cloud or, you know. Um, and that was a reference to the idea that we had a really intelligent man who created a bunch of things that are only <laughs> that are only safe in the hands of a really intelligent man. And even then, not, not always, right? I mean, there's, there's plenty of examples of these drones going around and killing people that they are not intended to kill and, and destroying lives during the Obama administration. And so I was, I was trying to get at this idea that when you set these things up and say, no, no, I'll do a good job, I can take care, well, you, what happens afterwards? There was, a, there was a good chunk of research I did on, um, on the psychology of radicalization. And some of that was not by choice. Some of that was because I was a journalist covering these things. So I spent a lot of time interviewing um, people who had direct contact with these recruiters, with people whose job it was to find impressionable young people and convince them that the best thing they could do for their religion was strap on a bomb and walk into a shopping mall. And you hear stories of things like, and a lot of this made, this, made it into the book, stories of, um, for example, there's this one guy who he would befriend, he would find kids who were lonely, felt out of place. None of, none of that part is new. You find people who don't, don't feel a sense of belonging and you exploit that. Um, and he would do things like he would say, um, okay, brother, have you heard about what's happening to Muslims in Kashmir? Uh, have you heard about the slaughter of Muslims in Palestine? Have you heard about the slaughter of Muslims in X, Y, Z? Um, and one of those would not be true. One of them would just be something he invented. You slip it in there, and after a while, it, what you're doing is training them to, not, to no longer distinguish between the truth and what they'd like the truth to be. That's a central tenet of doing all of this stuff, right? Um, and I spent a lot of time researching the sort of people who do that. And, and one of the, the, the real things you want to get at is um, closing the border between reality and fantasy. Uh, and once you get into that, then you just apply the tenet of, uh, God wants you to do this, you know, if you want to go to heaven. Some, some kind of absolutism at the end, but where you really have to get to is the part where it no longer matters what happened or what didn't happen. Uh, that was, a lot of the research led down that path. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're out of time. So I want to thank you all. Thank you, Omar. Thank you so much. Everybody. Thank you.